Hello, I'm Avram Friedman, the Executive Director of the Canary Coalition. The following is a video recording of a public listening session in Asheville, North Carolina, conducted by the Department of Environmental Quality, or DEQ, ostensibly to seek the input of citizens into Governor Cooper's Executive Order 80, setting the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the state 40% from 2005 levels by the year 2025. I find it necessary to begin the viewing of this recording with some editorial commentary given the nature of this public hearing and the methods used by the state agency to lead the discussion and define its parameters. I'll begin by providing some global context to this meeting. Late last year, in 2018, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, issued its latest consensus report informing world leaders and the press that humanity has entered the beginning of an existential crisis. Due primarily to human activity and the production of greenhouse gases, our planet has begun to experience profound changes that are on the brink of becoming irreversible. These changes could render our global environment virtually uninhabitable, threatening life as we know it. The world's ice caps are melting causing sea level rise much more rapidly than anyone anticipated, threatening a major portion of the world's human population residing in coastal regions. The oceans are becoming warmer and more acidified, threatening the viability of coral reefs and the extinction of many types of sea life that provide a significant portion of the world's food supply. More extreme weather patterns and global temperature changes are threatening wildlife habitats everywhere on Earth. Feedback loops are beginning to accelerate the process of climate change. The IPCC now estimates that the global community has perhaps a decade to address this issue by virtually eliminating human-produced greenhouse gases we, if we have any hope of avoiding the worst catastrophic consequences. On December 7, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, the United States of America faced another existential crisis. Our leaders did not spend much time discussing whether it was economically beneficial to go to war with Japan. They didn't wonder whether we had the technology to fight a war or if it was worth the investment to transform industries to develop those technologies. They didn't take an incremental approach based on political expediency. Our leaders recognized the existential threat we faced and immediately mobilized the nation into survival mode. Industries were directed to begin producing tanks, airplanes, battleships, guns, and artillery instead of cars, appliances, pots, and pans. This transformation was in full swing within six months of the attack. The current existential threat of the climate crisis requires no less of a mobilization and transformation to ensure the survival of humanity on this continent and around the world. But as of today, our local, state, and federal governments seem to still be in business-as-usual mode. If this DEQ public hearing process is representative of our state government's response to the climate crisis, we are in deep trouble. There is no sense of urgency exhibited by this process. There is too much concern for staying within existing parameters of industrial and financial market behavior. At this point in time, the primary concern should be identifying the physical and technological possibilities of energy efficiency, solar energy, wind energy, geothermal energy, ocean wave and tidal energy, how can we deploy them, and how quickly. Instead, we are seeing an effort to maintain a highly centralized energy monopoly based on more fossil fuel pipelines and nuclear energy with no concerted effort to reduce overall energy consumption and transform to 100% renewables as the scientifically based imperative requires. This is a prescription for mass extinction. 
the issuing of an executive order to address climate change was the right thing to do by Governor Cooper. But right now, we need substance and urgency, not window dressing and political grandstanding with the goal of providing a smoke stream for preserving the power of Duke Energy and the fossil fuel industry. We need to get real about climate change and fast. About a clean energy future for North Carolina starting at 1 o'clock, going on until 3.30. We wanted to bring to the governor's attention that approving the Atlanta Coast Pipeline while striving to provide a clean energy future for North Carolina is a complete oxymoron and we need to oppose the Atlanta Coast Pipeline for a clean energy and sustainable future. Thank you. That was good. We're here because uh, the Department of Environmental Quality over a year ago uh, issued what's called a 401 water quality permit for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. It had no business doing that since there were a lot of unanswered questions and it, there's also been significant changes in the original permit application uh, which uh, has have not been considered by Department of Environmental Quality. The most important part of that is that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is going into South Carolina even though the permit does not uh, grant it the right to take it into South Carolina. It's probably also, the gas from this is probably going to end up in China since that's the only way fracked gas can uh, be profitable. So uh, DEQ has the authority and the legal authority and the power to revoke the permit that they gave a year ago. We are here to tell them they've got to revoke it because the governor has said he's going to cut back greenhouse gas emissions by f like six million uh, metric tons of greenhouse gases a year, whereas the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, if it's built, will produce 68 million. In other words, about 12 times the, uh, the amount of greenhouse gases that Cooper says he's going to cut back. So uh, we, are, we are adamantly opposed to the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and wish that DEQ would pay attention to this. Welcome to the Collider. Uh, my name is Megan Robinson and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here. It's really encouraging to see each and every one of you here today to um, elevate con questions, concerns, and ideas that truly represent the best interests of our region, our state, and our role in the climate movement. And it's fun, I actually recognize a lot of you from movie nights and science pubs and other events that we've had here, so it's great that we could all come together here today. Just very briefly about the Collider for those of you who are unfamiliar with the space. We are a global innovation center that's dedicated to advancing climate entrepreneurship. So we support uh, startups, businesses, um, organizations across almost every sector that are using data to help the world become more resilient to climate change. Because of our strategic proximity to NOAA National Centers for Environmental Information, which houses the world's largest collection of weather and climate data, the Collider leverages its network of local and global experts to support the growth and development of climate science and technology. Um, many important climate-influenced effects, storm intensity, sea level, um, sea level rise, and the frequency of heat waves have already changed due to past greenhouse gas emissions and will continue to change for decades to come. So the work that's being proposed and discussed here in North Carolina around clean energy, electric vehicles, um, mitigation strategies, and resiliency planning is extremely critical, and we are excited that some of the work that's being done by our businesses and startups here is leading the way in innovatively designing solutions and bringing together conversations like this. Um, and I'll turn it over for the rest of the programming, but I encourage you all to have a great conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being here. My name is Sushma Maysmore. I'm here from Raleigh. I am the State Energy Director, and I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment. I work for the executives in our Department of Environmental Quality. Um, I am the lead person um, coordinating the implementation of the Executive Order 80. 
Today's purpose is to talk about one component of Executive Order 80, and that is related to the section in which DEQ is charged to develop the Clean Energy Plan. What you're going to be seeing is about two and a half hours of a, of a facilitated dialogue. Um, it is part of a larger effort that we're doing statewide that began in Raleigh. Uh, we're here to hear your input, get your input, your feedback on a vision for North Carolina's clean energy future. Our purpose is to go around the state, talk to folks. We have a whole team of folks that are doing a variety of technical analysis and data gathering and talking with stakeholder communities. So my goal here, uh, this is an informal process. Um, but we do have, in order to engage and ask um, real direct questions such that we can come to some um, recommendations, uh, we're going to go through an exercise that we did in Charlotte last week. It worked well. And so we're going to replicate that, but there is room to deviate from that as needed. Um, so today's agenda is to talk about a little bit. I'm not going to focus too much on the the entire Executive Order 80, but I'm going to focus more on the clean energy process, the plan development process. Then my staff will be uh, here helping me on a variety of topics. One, we're going to show you some videos of our uh, Raleigh workshop. This was an all-day event we hosted with about 75 people from abroad uh, interest groups. Um, and the results of those workshops allowed folks to have some fundamental <coughs> initial understanding, level the playing field in terms of knowledge related to the energy sector. Um, we're going to do a little polling through using your, your phones uh, to get some feedback on your level of understanding and your level of uh, acceptance on the way the power sector is managed and utilized in our state. We will also go through a value analysis to find out what um, uh, guiding principles are of most important to you as a person or as an organization. And then we're going to collect some comments related to these five questions that we asked. Uh, we've been asking around the state. I uh, started in Raleigh, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's next and how we go from here. So I'm um, sure that from the look of the crowd, everyone's read or knows about Executive Order 80. Um, it basically was released and announced by the governor in October. It is to this day the only executive order that he has personally and publicly signed. Uh, it was in the aftermath of the, the recent uh, storms that have uh, affected our people and our businesses and our communities so drastically. Uh, there was a news report today about the resiliency of the people, but more of the recovery is still going on. Um, and it is in recognition related to when Governor Cooper first uh, started, he committed the state to be one of the Climate Alliance states. In that commitment, we had agreed to reduce our carbon emissions as agreed upon in the Paris Accord um, that the entire nation had committed to a, back then, a two degree temperature rise. And the equated to emission reductions is 26 to 28 percent of greenhouse gas emissions being reduced by 2025 from a baseline of 2005. And so this, is, this was his next step, and that was creating a comprehensive strategy uh, vision for how we understand the impact of climate change to North Carolina. What we do about it in terms of mitigation and adaptation and building resilient communities. It calls for a recognition that clean energy resources and clean energy development through clean transportation as well as clean utilization of our energy sector is one of the means for mitigating the impacts of climate change. And it directs the Department of Environmental Quality to develop a, a plan that enables us to create a smart, resilient, equitable power grid. And um, there's also a, quite a bit of information in there, and I won't get into it, in terms of building resilient communities. And one other thing that, that is important to note is that um, the plan is designed or asked to be developed recognizing that technology innovation 
research and development and our workforce that exists in our state is our biggest value. And that uh, promote, promoting that and creating opportunities of growth and eventual implementation of those technologies and those resources into the market force will result in a cleaner, efficient power grid. And so it calls for various departments, not only the EQ, but the Commerce, the Department of Transportation, and Department of Administration um, to enable these market drivers and create an expansion uh, in terms of job creation and economics. And so that's what we are here for, not only looking at the environment, looking at the climate, but looking at the, at the economic opportunity associated with clean energy. So as we, uh, we have released a process plan, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that process consists of. Part of it is an open dialogue with, with the stakeholder community to get your input. In order to make sure that this dialogue occurs and this input in, is in a, in a sort of uh, organized and facilitated process, we, we have, we're doing this in multiple ways. Um, and so what we're first trying to do is, it is an open, inclusive process. There's a way for you to come here. You could comment through website. You could uh, attend a variety of listening sessions we're doing across the state. Um, but the, the starting point is vision building. And that is assessing where we are, what's our landscape in the power sector now. It, it goes into what is happening across the country in terms of technology development. Utilities are changing. Um, there's a transformation occurring across the country in terms of clean energy integration into, into power generation. And so we're examining these evolving and changing uh, uh, systems uh, into the market. And then the last question is the most important is how do we enable and bring those um, innovations and those solutions into our state and grow it through policy recommendations, through regulatory reforms, and other actions that we can take publicly through state government, but also privately as citizens and as, as businesses that operate in our state. So in order to execute that process, we came up with four methods of engagement. The first, I talked a little bit about it. These are what we call facilitated workshops. We're having six between now and July. The dates of them have been passed around, and they're also posted on our website. There's a link on here on the right. Um, these are one full day workshops. We can't accommodate everybody. We can take a certain number of people because of the room size. Um, but we have brought in national ex experts from the country, Rocky Mountain Institute and Regulatory Assistance Project. Both of these groups are well known and recognized. They have assisted other state agencies, but not administrative agencies, really the Utilities Commission and their legislature to evaluate the future of their state in the energy sector. Um, so if you're interested in participating or you want to have send somebody there, we request, we're requesting that a form be filled out. The method two is this one. Um, we have about 14 listening sessions scheduled thus far, and it's open to all. And the method three is we're combining with uh, events that are occurring, occurring, like the State Energy Conference, uh, Manufacturers Association workshops, to spread the news and get their input into the process. And of course, there's the online input. We've set up a form for, for getting your comments. Um, and then quickly, what we're doing is after and in between the workshops, we're asking questions. Um, between now and April, the main questions are at the bottom right here in this blue. We had our first workshop, second workshops on April 1. And the question we're asking is, what is North Carolina's vision of a clean energy future? And how different is it from the path we're on currently? And how well do our current policies and regulatory structures, the business models that we operate under for our primary investor-owned utilities, how those practices help us achieve that vision. The next question we're asking in the months of end of April and May is what is happening across the country? What is the changing landscape? How are policy drivers and technology innovations changing and influencing the, the, the fostering and emerging of uh, clean energy solutions? And then finally, we're bringing it back into, well, what do we do about it? What are the recommendations for making keeping things as they are in certain cases, but making improvements and making changes uh, to 
to that vision. And I'm not going to go into the details of methods. Um, they're all here for your, your viewing. All of these slides are on the website. And then finally, I'm going to take a minute about talking about the overall timeline. So between February and July, we'll be doing the roadshow, we'll be doing the technical analysis. And then in June and July, we'll be drafting our plan. Um, sometimes around late July, early August, we'll release the draft plan for public input. And then in September, um, the revised plan based on public input will be delivered to the uh, Interagency Climate Council. This is the council that Executive Order 80 established. These are secretary level positions that are uh, going to be part of uh, the overall implementation of EO80. And our goal is to deliver the final report to the governor in, on October 1st. So that is uh, uh, the overall uh, purpose of what we're here today. I'm going to hold off on questions until after we get to the next series of slides. I'm going to try to keep up with the timing here. Um, so next we're going to have a viewing of various uh, uh, videos uh, of presenters who came and gave, set up, laid the um, playing field in terms of our understanding of the power sector. So Kevin's going to help me get that started. While these, while these videos are going on, um, let's see, Jeanette, can you pass on index cards? Okay, they all have it. Um, we're asking you to go through this one question. Think about it throughout these videos. Um, what are the most important things that these presentations raise that you want us, the department, to make sure we don't lose the sight of? Okay? These presentations are, are going to build your knowledge level um, from where the power sector is uh, to the kind of uh, things that are used to build um, the grid. So the first topic that is, is shown in the agenda is uh, Kate Konchnik from the Duke Nicholas Institute. We'll be talking about the power electricity system and the regulatory structures and barriers will be talked about from Jonas Monas, who is a an attorney over at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, both of them are, are going to talk about topic one that's in your agenda. So, um, okay, a couple of things to note here. Coal, that, that dark blue line, the one that started at the top. Going along in the 2000s, coal's about, um, at that point, like two thirds of power generation in North Carolina. And then you see a pretty precipitous drop. From 2009 to 2015, 45% of that drops out. You see at the bottom, starting crawling along there in the green, is natural gas. Natural gas, as late as 2007, use of it to produce electricity in North Carolina was well behind the national average. At that point, about 3% of electricity in the state was powered by natural gas. The national average at that time was almost a quarter. In that time, North Carolina has, has made up time fast. We're about at the national average now. We're a little bit more than 30% electricity generation by natural gas. The country average is about 34. And you see it's about a mirror image of coal. As the coal was retired, it was replaced by natural gas in generation here. You have a couple of pretty constant players here. You've got nuclear in the purple going straight across, kind of just doing its thing for a while now. Uh, same with hydro. <coughs> kind of pretty consistent players, that, you know, both non-emitting sources, sort of playing a very consistent role over time here. Another change is that solar and wind barely making a, a dent until the last few years. So non-existent virtually past 2010 and now at that point at this point solar is really doing all the heavy lifting here and it's about three percent of generation in North Carolina. There are a couple reasons for this. There are market drivers and there are policy drivers. On the market side we've got lower natural gas prices and I'd also say more consistent natural gas prices. We saw a lot of spikiness in natural gas prices throughout the 2000s. 2001 it was about eight dollars 2003, it was back up about $8. Uh, 
Um, after hurricanes, we tend to see big spikes. After Katrina, it was over $13. After Ike, it was almost back up to 13 Since 2009, though, it has stayed in this sort of comfortable range of between maybe 3 and $5 per MMBTU. Uh, so not only is it lower, but it's also remaining pretty constant. And the fact that it's been remaining pretty constant, despite its history of volatility, has been making more and more utilities and independent power producers comfortable relying on this fuel source. Whether we'll continue to see the, that sort of leveling out of the prices, unclear, although a lot of people feel like the shale gas development and has really changed the picture. We have so much more supplies and so much more sort of economically feasible uh, plays to exploit. Of course, it emits carbon, about half the amount of carbon dioxide out of the stack is coal, but that, since we're here talking about a clean energy plan, that's going to become relevant. Lower renewables prices as well. We also see customer demand for clean energy, and this has been something really interesting in North Carolina. Even more than in other states, when you look at polls, this is not a partisan issue here anymore. A very, very high percentage of people are more supportive of political candidates, regardless of the party they affiliate with if that candidate is for clean energy. And so it's really no longer this sort of partisan political wedge issue in North Carolina. And you see that in customer demand, both residential and also corporate. You also have a lot of big tech companies coming to the Southeast and coming to North Carolina with sustainability and clean energy goals and are demanding renewable energy to meet those goals. One example of the lower renewable prices, solar has dropped really remarkably in the last 10 years. This is a SunShot graph. SunShot initiative was something started by Secretary Chu in the Department of Energy. He really drew on his experience from Bell Labs and thought, you know what, we need to set really ambitious goals and then put together multidisciplinary teams to try to achieve those goals. SunShot cannot take credit for all of, all of this. Uh, there's also a very large country in East Asia that has played a huge role in bringing down costs of installed solar. Uh, but there's been a lot of research and development and a lot of advancements made in the improvement of the performance and the cost effectiveness of solar. And so you see what seemed to be a really ambitious goal, which was to drop installed solar costs 75% from 2010 to 2020, <coughs> has already been achieved in the utility scale solar. And we're getting close in commercial and residential. <coughs> There's also been policy drivers for that really rapid generation mix change that we've seen in the last t uh, 10 years in North Carolina. Uh, Jonas is going to talk a lot about the renewable policies, both federal and really focused on the state policies that have driven a lot of that, that uptick of solar in particular. Uh, there is some concern now with the 30% solar tariffs that we've put on solar imports, whether that might have a chilling effect on the sort of demand and interest in building utility scale solar. But for right now, this is, this is looking like um, a good future for that particular, uh, renew that, that particular type of power generation, at least from the cost side of things. We've also had environmental laws. And there's been a, there was a really interesting complementarity that happened in North Carolina between the Clean Smokestacks Act, which was enacted in 2002, an ongoing Clean Air Act litigation against a lot of the largest coal-fired power plants in the state. Uh, Clean Smokestacks Act set really aggressive standards for NOx and SOx for the power fleet in North Carolina. It also had a really interesting sentence in it that said, if you end up having to put, if you're a utility and you have to put on pollution control equipment as a result of a federal court order, you can't pass those costs off to your ratepayers. So you saw as the Clean Air Act case sort of warmed up, heated up. In fact, post-2007, when Duke Energy lost a pretty significant issue in that case at the Supreme Court, that is one of the drivers for the beginning of a pretty aggressive retirement or control schedule that you saw from 2009 to 2015, with that very important backstop that the North Carolina legislature had put in place. You also see in 2009, the Clean Clean Smokestacks Act is amended, and in it is a provision that if there is a coal site in North Carolina, and if the utility goes to the commission and or goes to the agency and asks for permits to retire the coal plant and build a gas plant, that permitting gets expedited and is done in 45 days. 
Remember the graph I saw, or I showed of, as soon as coal was dropping, you had that mirror image of natural gas increasing. So there's a policy driver there. As a result, you've got some pretty significant power sector emissions trends. So we're emitting less than 10% of sulfur dioxide from the power sector in, in North Carolina than we were 10 years ago. Demand trends. We are generally seeing a flattening of electricity demand in this state. And this is tracking national averages as well. I split it out into the three sectors because one of the reasons is that our economy is shifting to a less energy intensive economy. So you do see a drop in industrial that happens about 10 years ago. But that does not fully explain this. So we also can look to energy efficiency policies that are sort of flattening out that demand curve. So this is an energy efficiency chart. Jonas is going to get into the different types of service providers in the state, but generally investor-owned utilities serve about two-thirds of the customers and deliver about three-quarters of the load. Another thing to note in this chart, if you go back to look at it, these are only incremental increases of energy efficiency each year. So if I, say, switch out a light bulb this year, that more energy-intensive light bulb is going to give me energy savings for more than just this year. That would be the cumulative effect if you keep adding that up over time. This is just what is added to the mix each year. Uh, electricity rates and bills. So North Carolina right now is about nine, uh, $10.94 per kilowatt hour. That's pretty cheap in the United States. Uh, we've got below us the sort of Pacific Northwest with very, very, very cheap federal hydro, which we're never going to beat. Um, the rates have hovered about 11 cents in the last 10 years, but we've become relatively lower in rates than other parts of the country. So 10 years ago, we were like number 33, and now we're 41. So other, other states, their rates have increased. Our consumption is higher than average, and that's in part because we're the 11th or 12th hottest state, too, in the summer, so we've got that low. Also, relative energy efficiency policy. Average monthly bill, $114. One thing to note here when we think about rates, uh, equity. Uh, there's a lot of poverty in this, in this state. We have about 15% of people living in poverty. That means a household of four making about $25,100 a year. That's the poverty line. So this monthly bill is about 5% of that family's income going to pay for the electricity bill. You also think about renters. The majority of renters in North Carolina live in poverty. They tend to be in substandard housing, which may lead to much higher bills, and they're not weatherized. So where are we headed? These are the projections based on IRPs. Um, and you see continued, there's some leveling out in the near term of coal, but then a continued downturn of coal. You've got nuclear staying about the same. You've got hydro staying about the same. You have both kinds of gas, combined cycle and combustion turbines, on a pretty sharp increase. And then leveling out in the mid-2030s. That tells you the same thing. A couple reasons why. Coal fleet. What we've seen so far are the older, smaller units retiring. And right now, we've got some bigger ones that are a little younger that are in the mix that are going to sort of maintain through the 2020s. But then, as we all know, time marches on and we all get older. And as those plants get older, and if there is that increasing pressure from lower renewables costs and lower natural gas costs and or carbon regime, you see more of these forced out. Nuclear fleet, all, all five of our nuclear units have been relicensed for the next 20 years. They're all fairly young, and so they're pretty new in that next extension. There will be a question. <laughs> less than 20 years out, they'll begin their permitting process to extend their licenses to what would be 80 years. We only have one unit at this point in the United States that is seeking that 80-year extension, and all eyes are on that to see if the NRC will license a reactor that far into the future. Uh, Jonas is going to talk about renewables, but we're seeing that wind is just not sort of getting a foothold here quite yet for economic reasons, at least according to the investor-owned utilities. We've got some strong drivers, policy drivers from North Carolina. Storage not really making a dent yet, <coughs> uh, which is really interesting given all of 
the solar we have. And one thing I did just want to point out, going back here, these are capacity projections, so just to make the difference between generation and capacity. So the, the slides of where we are today, looking at all the various types of power, that was what is actually producing power. This is what is installed. Um, when you've got nuclear, nuclear runs at north of 90%, so if it's there, it's on, and it's running, and it's producing electricity. Solar, much smaller utilization factor, both for, you know, practical reasons, the sun's not shining, and also for, based on the comfort of the dispatcher. Uh, so here you see solar is way high up there, but this is capacity and not generation. Okay. Just end here, and I've got both Duke Nicholas Institute, where I work, we also do energy initiative, Brian Murray is here, and we've been working on a lot of these issues together. Um, Sarah Adair, I think also. <laughs> I may have helped with this slide long ago, but these are some we've added, we've replaced the things that we're thinking about. So just things to think about in these plans is sort of what are we thinking about distributed generation? What are we thinking about solar? What are we thinking about the internet and digitalization and maybe the use of demand response as a tool in our generation mix? And then performance-based rate making, because we saw that flat demand. We saw a potential you know, uptick in lots of new capital costs. We've got new transmission upgrades to do, and that's being spread over fewer kilowatt hours. The way our rates are set up now, there may be a disincentive to do some of the things that we want to do. So thinking about how to change the incentive structure. Who was that was just speaking? Yes. So uh, on your agenda is a person's name and her organization. So Kate Konchnick is uh, one of the leading persons at the Duke University Nicholas Institute. Um, she was invited to, to talk about setting the, the level playing field in terms of where is our energy coming from, where are we expecting to go based on the term IRP is integrated resource planning. This is uh, the process through which uh, investor-owned utilities are required to submit a plan every two years to give you a futuristic look as where they're planning to add capacity and operate their units. And so I'm going to take actually one or two questions, just just you know, uh, get a feel for whether there's any dying questions you have uh, that you need clarifications. Yes, sir. So as you could tell by the banner, we are very concerned about the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And uh, from what we know of EO80, it is uh, scheduled to cut back about 5.6 million metric tons of greenhouse gases a year. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline, if it is built, is going to produce approximately 68 million metric tons of greenhouse gases a year, 12 times what Governor Cooper and EO80, and we applaud EO80 and the work you're doing to make it happen, but 12 times that will be uh, produced by the, uh, by the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. So I'm surprised that doesn't get to be part of the discussion here because uh, if the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is built, all the incredible work you are doing and the people in this room are doing may be for naught because we, we, we go off the charts with greenhouse gases and we're already in catastrophic climate change. It'll get even worse. So uh, my question is, how do you think about that? And why isn't the Department of Environmental Quality reviewing the permit, which it granted for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, in order to really clarify what's going on here and why the the, the citizens of this state may be subject to one of the largest pipelines in the world that uh, will, will, may kick us over into extreme catastrophic climate change. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And so I am going to try to answer it. You probably are probably going to want more explanations on it, but in the, in the interest of time, I'll just say a few things. Um, so Atlantic Coast Pipeline's uh, emissions that you quoted, um, it is true as a state, we are a, a fairly energy intensive state, as you saw in the numbers. We're ranked eighth in the nation in terms of generation. Why do we generate all this electricity? We consume all the electricity. And on top of that, we, we import 10% more of what we consume from outside states. So, as a resource in order to supplement our need, we were having to bring it from across our state boundaries. So whether it's natural gas, 
while there's coal. You know, we don't have an ability to bring in internal energy resources to generate our own power. And times are changing. And uh, as solar, perhaps wind, uh, as, as more utility scale, larger um, uh, implementation of those resources are being added, then those costs are driving those decisions to make those options more feasible and more economically feasible. As far as ACP, um, one of the things that I, the, the number you quoted is an upstream uh, greenhouse gas emissions added from the fracking, from the recovery, from transportation, and all of that. We have, as a department in our greenhouse gas emissions inventory, quantified the the in-state um, methane emissions losses from the transmission sector, from the compressor sector, from um, valves and fittings and all that. And it equates to about, um, and, and don't quote me on this because I'm going off the top of my memory, but of the 150 or so million metric tons of total greenhouse gas emissions emitted from the state in the inventory, from the natural gas pipeline, the incremental increase from ACPs in, is less than a million metric tons. So when you account for all of the downstream emissions, you got to account for it in every fuel that we import. You got to, you know, we're importing coal. We're importing all of the uh, fossil fuel related to cars and trucks that we run. And so even though that inventory, which is 155 or so million metric tons, if you look at the upstream and the downstream impact, which we call a total value change, those emissions associated with our energy consumption is huge, like you said. And what's changing are these market drivers uh, in uh, offering us alternative solutions to that um, path forward. Here. Here. Yes, sir. My name is Grant Millen, and I will be writing a commentary about some of the clean tire plan um, Things that I've heard, I'm already seeing about civic engagement that, that could be uh, changed. Um, but first, though, I wanted to this point about what to do about climate change, our role in, in North Carolina as outside of the top 10 greenhouse emitter emission states in, North, in the United States, um, North Carolina is in the next group of uh, the, the second top, in the top 20 that we're in the bottom uh, 20 in the, in the next 10 top emitting greenhouse, top greenhouse emitting states, North Carolina is one of those states, so we're right up there in the um, greenhouse gas, gas emissions uh, per state. But gaseous fuel is going to be important. I don't think we should be using um, unnecessary amounts of natural gas can't replace the current system with batteries and solar and some wind in North Carolina. You're going to get some wind on the coast. Nobody wants wind here in the mountains. Um, though we might end up with some up here. And hydrogen. We could be producing hydrogen here in the mountains, and I can tell people how. Renewable hydrogen, by the way. So I'm sorry. And, sir, what's the question, answer. sir? I'm and, and I'm just going to talk to you as my public. Servant. I'm just going to talk to you, man, straight up. Um, we could have shrunk the size of the actual natural gas plant that's going to be coming online here shortly with fuel cells, grid fuel cells. But you don't have a discussion about all of our options going on in this state, and you're not facilitating a real, uh, a real options discussion, man, from what I'm seeing and what I know about how, it will, how you all do things. But that's my statement, it, it, and I wanted everybody to hear it versus just written statements. And you can respond how you wish, if you see a response from you about how you're going to, like HP 589 Energy Storage Study. Why, here's a question, why was hydrogen excluded? It, it, it's mentioned, but it's just not, it just wasn't taken seriously. How can you have a slide about our <coughs> storage options when you've, been, when you've eliminated hydrogen, and it's DEQ who eliminates hydrogen systems as an option for the state, by the way. So I'm going to try to answer that question very quickly in the interest of time. Okay. Um, the integrated resource process is 
is the primary means under which a utility provides a, an indication of how their utilities like Duke Energy and Dominion, the large investor-owned utilities. It is up to the Utilities Commission. I think a lot of, there's a, there are various state entities that are involved in, in the decision making, and I want to make that clear. It is the Utilities Commission that regulates the power sector. It is the Utilities Commission that drives the regulatory process and the rules under which we operate under. The legislature designs the laws under which the Utilities Commission operates. The Environmental uh, Quality Department um, issues permits usually after those decisions have been made. So when a certificate for convenience for a power plant, whether that power plant is natural gas or solar or other means, those decisions are made at a different level. I think I just want to make that clear. For something like Atlantic Coast Pipeline and now the Mountain Valley Pipeline Southgate, these decisions are made at the federal level by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. FERC has the authority for interstate pipeline projects. ACP decision was made by FERC way before this particular administration came into power. Right now, FERC is making decisions on the MVP Southgate project. This is the time to speak up. This is the time to get on and explain whether or not the state requires a need. The utilities are saying there is a need, there's a demand. You will see we as a DEQ have stepped up and we have submitted a letter to FERC stating whether or not there is a need. When we say a need, need is the reason how FERC um, authorizes and approves the construction of a pipeline. Once those authority has been exercised by those commissioners at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, then literally the Utilities Commission at the state level and any agencies have to abide by the state-related authority. And those are the land quality, the air quality, and the water quality-related uh, permitting actions. And just I just want to level that playing field so there's a clear understanding of the, the complexity towards the energy market. I just want to rebut that fast. You just well, told me you, just don't know, you don't know anything about hydrogen systems. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm, I'm Marjorie McGurk, climate scientist. Thank Katie for me for that excellent presentation on power production. I especially, um, I'm especially grateful that she um, mentioned the regulatory aspects that allow a power plant to move from uh, coal to gas. Are there similar uh, policy um, instruments in power production that allow for areas to rapidly convert to, say, wind turbine um, power production and to uh, greatly, greatly expand solar? That is what we're here for. We're actually asking is whether there is an interest and in whether or not the current regulatory practices and um, policies in place are enabling that. And so one of the things we're asking is, what is it that you want? Do you know how to get there? What's preventing? What are the barriers? And do you have ideas and solutions? Thank you. All right, I'm going to move on to the next uh, slides. And again, uh, the cards are asking questions. Uh, what are the, uh, the things that you want us to keep and not lose sight of? So Jonas is going to talk about the, the, the uh, regulatory structures. OK, so this is an uh, uh, imperfect chart. I use this when I teach um, energy law. There could be a lot more. Um, uh, boxes and certainly a lot more arrows on here, but I think it makes the general point. Um, when we're thinking about uh, uh, regulation of the electricity sector, it's not just utility commission oversight. It's not just rate setting. There's a lot that that is uh, that influences uh, if a utility is going to build something, and uh, and if they answer the yes to that question, what is the utility going to build? Okay, so I'll just uh, start here. So uh, mandates. We have a renewable portfolio standard here in North Carolina, um, existing infrastructure, uh, pipelines, transmission lines, uh, fuel price projections, uh, electricity demand going forward, available financing, so incentives, loan guarantees, tax credits, um, uh, et cetera, available technologies, right, what's the suite of, of options uh, available for uh, 
generating electricity, uh, federal and state environmental laws, um, and then uh, back over here, state utility regulations, so um, rate setting. Each one of these factors has laws, policies, regulations that influence um, uh, whether uh, an electricity provider is going to build something in the end, if so, what. And I think for this conversation, as, as the workshop um, uh, discussion progresses, I think it's important to keep this broader uh, suite of, uh, of policy drivers in mind. Okay. Um, traditional uh, rate setting, traditional regulation. So the, the state and the investor and utilities have made an agreement. Um, the, uh, the utilities get an exclusive service territory. So for the, the map that I showed earlier, right, the, the retail provider of electricity, um, uh, with very few exceptions, the retail provider of electricity on those maps, that's the only entity that can sell power to an end user. Um, in exchange for that exclusive service territory, uh, the investor and utility agrees uh, to provide uh, reliable and safe power. Um, uh, can't discriminate. So if you're in that, that service territory and you uh, want power, the utility has to get it to you. Um, and uh, the state PUCs uh, set electricity rates and returns on investments, which I'll say a bit more about in just a moment. Um, I won't, for the sake of time, won't read uh, these all of these roles here that the PUC plays. The slides will be um, available Flip here to the next slide, and we'll talk about rate setting. So uh, here we have the North Carolina Utilities Commission in the state, seven commissioners. We also have a um, public staff, which is uh, under the NCUC, but operates as a kind of a, a separate agency, the consumer advocate there. Um, uh, the PUC hears rate cases and um, investor and utilities submit annual integrated resource plans. Uh, to the Utilities Commission, and that's um, available to the public once submitted. Okay, price regulation. How does the Utility Commission set rates? Um, and this is the, 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 the 101 version of this conversation. Um, we have uh, a revenue requirement. So the Utility Commission is setting setting rates based on the cost of providing power, right? So not, not based on uh, 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 market competition here, but based on an assessment of what it takes to provide power to the system. Um, o in this formula is um, operating expenses. So these are variable expenses like fuel prices. So Kate mentioned that natural gas prices go up and natural gas prices go down. Um, uh, the investor and utility doesn't have to go to the Utilities Commission uh, and get permission to purchase power at different prices at, at, at any moment where that price fluctuation is taking place. So there's operating expenses. Um, that's passed on to the customers. Um, utility doesn't make money based on the operating expenses. These are expenses the utility it just has to be covered in order to keep the system going. Um, okay, so B in this one, this is rate right fix. These are the fixed costs. These are the, the capital costs. This is the steel, this is the concrete, right, that um, they go into the ground. Sorry, this is also something I've used for class, and that's the book that works for this. Um, that part. Um, uh, so, so this, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so this is, so the rate base, this is uh, when the utility has to build um, a power plant, when the utility is building um, um, transmission lines. This is going into the fixed cost part of the formula. And then I mentioned that the utility doesn't make money on the operating expenses, uh, but the little R here, this is the rate of return. Right? So this is, this is the amount of, um, of money that, Duke Energy uh, or Dominion right, can make uh, uh, based on its investments. This goes back to shareholders. And there's a reason for this, right? So um, these are investor-owned utilities. These are private companies. They have shareholders, but we're also part of the, the deal that we have with the investor-owned utility is the investor-owned utility is going to the marketplace to attract capital so it can make the investments that we expect it to make so that it can provide the reliable power. Um, so the, the rate of return. Uh, anytime there's a rate case, uh, if the rate of return is uh, uh, increased or decreased, that gets a lot of attention. Um, uh, I don't want to offer an opinion about what the rate of return uh, here in the state should be, but just know that the reason there's that rate of return and the reason that it, it's set uh, uh, where it's set is that's the Utility Commission's um, assessment of the, the amount of return that the, the private company needs to make in order to attract capital.
the interest of time, we're going to continue on to the next slide. Uh, we're talk it's uh, Steve Callan talking about the topic two. Now, the first topic was about the central power station and power plants and how the central hierarchy of power generation works. Now I'm going to talk about distributed energy resources. This is uh, the form of energy resources that are now surfacing from the distribution se uh, sector, uh, where um, um, solar and rooftop solar and the battery storage, all of these, all of these they, they used to call them disruptive technologies, how they're changing the way uh, power grid is dynamic, is changing. But instead of um, electricity flowing from top down, we're seeing a two-directional flow of, of energy generation. And uh, Steve Callan is going to set the uh, question on that. Um, can you explain again what these cards are for? You're just asking, answering this question. As you watch these slides, what elements do you want us to keep in mind and not lose sight of? Okay, and at the end of the here. At DEQ. At DEQ, yes. Based on what we're Based hearing. on what you're hearing. Gotcha. Thank you. And then at the end of the presentations, I'm gonna, we're going to collect those slides and we'll move on to the next exercise. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about distributed energy resources and about uh, distri distribution planning. These are probably two of the squishier things that you can talk about. Um, you know, you'll see the definition up here. Uh, this definition comes from the Nabruch manual. Uh, they use small electrical generators. I went back through this and said, generators, eh, that's not exactly right. Distributed energy resources includes a lot more than generators. And uh, it gets to some of Ryan's questions earlier about how we get energy efficiency involved in this. You see demand responses on my list. Microgrids. Uh, we just finished, of course, over at NC State in conjunction with some folks at NC Central, and thanks to uh, Brad's group over at the Collaboratory uh, and, of course, the legislature, the storage study. Uh, but certainly, storage fits into this discussion. Electric vehicle charging infrastructure fits into this discussion. DER is a lot of different things, some of them in front of the meter, some of them behind the meter. This said 10 megawatts, I believe, was Nehru's straw the line. I've seen people say that basically, you know, based on the way rules work in North Carolina, anything under 20 megawatts is DER. I've seen people say that basically if it's not behind the meter and on your rooftop, it's not DER. So uh, it's a little bit amorphous as to what we're talking about, but it's generally the smaller stuff that kind of fits at the distribution level on one side of the meter or the other that helps to make the grid work better. It's like the, if you, you're old enough to remember the old BASF commercials, it's it's not that we don't make this stuff, we make this stuff that works better. That's what a lot of the DER is. Distribution planning. This is the process that utilities use to kind of look at the grid and figure out down at that lower level where they can make the best application of DER technologies, or at least it's supposed to be that. Uh, I think that in some cases it's not that something that there's been a lot of attention on historically, and we're starting to see more interest in focusing on it. Uh, but basically identifying the existing system, upgrading uh, the aging infrastructure, especially when we identify it through things like storm damage, when the power goes out or somebody runs into a transformer or a pole with a car. Uh, accommodate new systems, all of these types of technologies that we're talking about, and build for the future as we move forward. Um, this is usually separate from the IRP, the Integrated Resource Planning Process, and the Transmission Planning Process. And if you think about the conversation about deregulation, in most states when they talked about deregulating, they kind of broke that into three pieces. And they said, you know, let's deregulate the wholesale generation stuff, the big guys. Let's deregulate the retail side of this because we could have a bunch of people do that. Of course, all the retail guys were buying their power from the same people, so that didn't go so well because there wasn't a lot of differentiation in, in services at that point. And electricity pretty much all cost the same. But everybody said poles and wires, let's leave that alone because, you know, let's regulate that traditionally because transmission seems to make, you know, the most sense as a regulated market. A little bit of history on that. You know, the value of DER to the North Carolina grid, well, you know, now DER can be an important non-wires alternative. It can be an important wired alternative as well. It's got a lot of different uh, applications, as I've alluded to. But you know, some of these things, you know, customer sided renewable energy production, energy storage for peak demand, shaving, uh, reducing solar clipping. Somebody was talking about the amount of solar that we might waste in this state. Uh, you know, you can do a lot with storage. Energy resilience, uh, and for that matter, energy, um, uh, what's the word that comes before resilience? Uh, I lost it in my head, but you know, before something goes down, um, Reliability, thank you. Got it. 
got to quit taking all these painkillers. It's killing me. <laughs> uh, but in raw ability and resilience, you know, comes from these DER resources potentially if we have if we put them on the grid in the right places and use them in the right way. It's also grid support, ancillary services, voltage support, frequency response, all kinds of things that can be valuable that can come out of DER resources. Now, to give you a little sense of DER penetration levels, and I talked about the fact that there's kind of the big DER and the little DER, and where you draw the lines, a little bit of a fuzz here. I don't think I have a laser pointer, but if you look at this chart, this is annual solar installation by year, and the blue is uh, light, if I had to guess, and that just pulled that number out of thin air, but it, the largest percentage by far of the solar installed in North Carolina uh, is utility scale solar, meaning that it's at probably somewhere in the two megawatts or greater range. Uh, for a long time, the sweet spot was five megawatts. We filled the sweet spot with House Bill 589, and now I'm going out in counties having to deal with projects that are as big as 400 megawatts, which uh, Trust me, if you're a county commissioner and somebody says they want to bring 400 megawatts of a brand new technology into your county, and oh, by the way, there's people that tell them that it, you know, it's going to make their cats explode or their, their hair fall out. Uh, it's tons of laughs talking about decommissioning of solar farms these days. This other, excuse me, this other chart is actually cumulative. So this is cumulative, whereas this is year by year. So uh, we get all the way up to about 800 uh, megawatts, or excuse me, 800 kilowatts, no, megawatts, excuse me, of cumulative installed DER technologies that are net metered. So these are mostly rooftop systems, smaller systems. That's just net metered. If you took that number and you added onto it what we call buy-all, sell-all systems, so systems kind of outside of net metering, a lot of the NC Green Power systems went in as buy-all, sell-all. Uh, and these are all 10 kilowatt and smaller, uh, you know, or maybe they might be a, up to a megawatt on a commercial scale. You know, if you add all of that together, it might double the size of that curve up to, you know, 1.4 uh, megawatts, uh, to the uh, gigawatts of, of solar. So what you see is the DER on rooftops, you know, like adds up to less than any one of each year since 2013 uh, for large scale solar stuff. The rooftop market is really out of balance with the utility scale market, and that's what I'm trying to get across here. Uh, policy supporting DER in North Carolina. Uh, our last panel talked about some of this, so I'll, I'll move quickly. But this has been kind of a success story in how public policy actually works. We used to have a 35% state tax credit. It got to a point we didn't need it anymore, at least for the utility scale stuff, and that tax credit went away. I would argue that some other technologies, mostly rooftop solar, could still use that 35% tax credit, maybe storage other technologies as well. Uh, we talked about the PURPA standard offer. Up until recently, that standard offer went up to 5 megawatts. It made projects really easy to do, up to 5 megawatts. We've changed that again with House Bill 589. Now PURPA is much sm smaller. We've got this CPRE program. Um, we've got the, the REPS, which really has almost no impact on the small systems whatsoever, but has been a driver for the larger systems. Net metering, which in North Carolina is it's pretty good. It's not great. It's not the worst I've seen. It's not the best I've seen. But it's been under threat and of renegotiation for so long at this point that a lot of people are scared to engage in the conversation because the rules seem uncertain. And so that's something that uh, is a problem. The other thing is that, and I, I hear this from my environmental friends all the time, most munis and co-ops don't offer net metering at all. Uh, they might offer buy-all, sell-all arrangements, but a lot of munis and co-ops just don't offer net metering, period. The property tax abatement has been a big deal for, again, for the large-scale systems. Uh, and then, of course, we have the new Duke Solar Energy rebate, which is great if you can get one. Uh, but unfortunately, the program was structured with a lot of enthusiasm out there. Uh, and so we saw the entire program for the residential systems consumed in, uh, somebody told me it was like three hours. Does that sound about right? Uh, for the first year. And I think it might have gotten like almost four hours in the second year. So, uh, you know, the commercial systems were gone within a couple of weeks. Uh, strangely, churches and nonprofits still have a few rebates available to them out there. So if you're like me and you're on your church's creation and care committee, uh, it's time to start talking. So that's the uh, a little preview on DERs. And in the interest of time, I could just stop. You know, we're, one thing I want to say is my team here from Air Quality and our energy office, we're not professional entertainers. We, we, we do not do this for a living. 
we actually have other jobs. We on a day-to-day -day basis, we we do a lot of other projects, and we're working on EO80 as a on top of our everyday duties. So we're here to do our best, and so you know if we make mistakes, that's because we're human, and uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions. There may be some some places or times where we we may not be able to answer your questions, but we'll be glad to get back with you. Uh, so in the interest of time, the last presentation is given by the University of North Carolina, the, the facility at Charlotte, the EPIC uh, host, and they talked about grid reliability and resiliency. And just show me a uh, show of hands if you know enough about it. I won't show that video. We'll move on to the next thing. Otherwise, uh, raise your hand if you'd like to see the reliability and resiliency uh, video. Okay. The fundamental basis behind this is last year, uh, Duke Energy introduced a rate case where they asked for a power forward plan, a $13 billion 10-year uh, um, cost recovery program for grid modernization. So if you know something about it, you'll be able to put all the pieces together. And uh, Robert does a great job of introduce, introducing you to that topic. But it is part of that overall big picture of how our electricity system works. Yes, sir. Before you do that, would you spend a minute on net metering? Explain it. Yeah, I'll do my best. Uh, I can talk about it because I have net metering in my home. It's it's from my perspective, and there's a variety of experts out there that will give their own uh, perspective. But it's basically when you generate your own power, you have rooftop solar, or you have ground-mounted solar panels, and that electricity you generate is not only just connected to your home and where your island is, but you're actually also interconnected with the grid. And the arrangement through which you're interconnected with the, with the grid is through a net metering program. And the net metering program has been approved by the commission and it's evolving over time. But it means that everything you generate, you're gonna consume in your house, but anything excess you don't need, you're gonna ship it back to the grid through this arrangement with the utility. And so that arrangement and, and the rate and the cost and the, how much you get back and how you, when you get back is part of the net metering uh, rules that the commission, Utilities Commission has established. Because I have that too, but every May 30th, all the excess that I have, that I produce, just disappears. It's not going to over to the next year. And that's, so if it's your utility, if it's Duke Energy, they have a whole group that answers these questions. And that, you know, I'm an engineer, and it took my husband and I four years to figure out how the heck they're doing their billing. <laughs> you know, and we're busy people, and every time I call, they're closed. So um, I suggest, and they have, they hired tons of engineers to support this program. And so you might have good answers. And North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association is a, another avenue, uh, NCSEA. Uh, they have folks that are very knowledgeable and they can help out. Okay. All right, next. Department of Energy defines grid resilience like so. Uh, we define a couple of different sort of dimensions, I guess, to it. Uh, basically making a grid that is more resilient, more reliable, more secure, more affordable, more flexible, and more sustainable. All right, so along those dimensions. Now, one thing I'll talk about a little bit here today is that reliability and resiliency are not the same thing. And people tend to, to sort of interchange those two things. Uh, we think a lot today about resiliency, uh, or sorry, re reliability, when, when really um, it's different than, than resiliency. So we need to think about those things a little bit, uh, a little bit differently. I wanted to take a bit of time and just talk a little bit about the difference between reliability and resiliency because some of the reason why people did not like the Power Forward program is because a lot of it is viewed as reliability and not resiliency. Uh, so reliability focuses upon normal operation of the grid. So, so grid disruptions during normal times, things like vegetation management problems, trees falling on lines, landscaping, squirrels, those sorts of things, very normal things. Uh, and there's good metrics that exist around those things today. So I have two of them up here, safety and safety. Basically what they look at is what's the, what's the average duration of an outage, how frequent are outages. There's a number of metrics that are well established. Regulatory bodies look at those all the time. When it comes to resiliency, however, resiliency doesn't focus on operation during normal times. Resiliency focuses on, on operation after things have really gotten bad, right? So after what we tend to call 
high impact, low frequency events like hurricanes or heavy winter storms. Uh, resiliency definitions, uh, there's, there's a, a quote here I have, it's, it's not, they're not formal enough to be used as regulatory terms of art. In other words, resiliency is something people are still struggling with exactly how to define it. And until those can be well defined, it's a little bit challenging to think about how those particular things uh, can be thought of from a regulatory perspective. Okay. Uh, and so there's, there's a number of studies out there, DOE, National Academies, have talked about the fact that we need to focus on this question. What is resiliency? Uh, and how do we, how do we value it uh, to be able to use it from a regulatory perspective? Uh, and so I included this graphic here. Again, this is from Duke's regulatory filing. Again, really looking at reliability things, not resiliency things. Uh, and that's, that's a little bit of an issue that one, that one comes in to play with. Uh, so a couple of things, I guess, when it comes to developing a modern grid in North Carolina, what's happening today? What are some of the things that are going on? Uh, so <clears throat> here, I, you know, this photograph here, I have an example of essentially a solar plus energy storage project in North Carolina down at Brunswick EMC, where you, where you have 12 megawatt hours of storage that has been added to the, to the system. Um, in terms of where we sit, uh, so North Carolina, obviously, as we talked about, is the second largest installed solar capacity base in the nation, uh, and 90% of that is third party owned. Uh, as we talked about, though, earlier, a lot of that is not fully utilized because we don't have the ability to, to, to store a lot of that energy. Uh, the recent energy storage study uh, found relatively limited value for solar in North Carolina, uh, even by 2030, uh, which, which is an important point. Uh, today, um, I wanted to look, I guess, in general, if you look at storage as a, as a resource or storage uh, as a tool, the, the, the two most cost-effective reasons nationally for utilizing energy storage today uh, the first one is demand charge reduction in areas with high demand charges. Uh, McKinsey, uh, Green Tech Media, a number of others have done studies that basically show about $15 per kilowatt is kind of the break-even point at which it becomes uh, worthwhile to have behind the meter energy storage. Uh, we're not there in terms of demand charges. Uh, and then in markets where there's a viable, uh, areas where there's a viable market for, for grid services from batteries, uh, we're not there either, right? Uh, now, resiliency, however, can change that. There's been a number of studies that have looked at uh, if you begin to value storage from a resiliency perspective, then the value of storage can significantly change. Uh, so I, an example, Puerto Rico after Maria. Uh, this is an epidemic of broken generators and diesel supply issues, right? Uh, getting diesel around after a storm is a problem. If you have PV plus energy storage, that can potentially change that, however, if you have the regulatory means to be able to deal with it. Uh, but the question is, to be able to get to that point, we have to look at how communities and businesses value the resiliency benefits of storage, right? Um, so like I said, NREL has done some initial work on this. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a question that really is not out there in terms of the regulatory space right now. Uh, North Carolina has led the development of, of PV uh, for two reasons, uh, in terms of utility scale PV at least. Um, favorable implementation of FERPA and favorable REP standard. Um, the, the key thing, though, that we see, we saw this in the, in the, in the energy storage study, is that third-party asset owners currently don't have any incentive, really, for energy storage in North Carolina. Um, that's something that needs to be dealt with. Um, this is an area that, that we're kind of working with right now at UNCC. Uh, we, we actually tried to partner with a number of the third-party asset owners in North Carolina. Uh, to go after a large DOE activity because we think that this is this is an area that needs to be tapped. How how do we address some of the both the technical and uh, policy concerns in this area? Uh, a couple of things, I guess, in terms of the current issues and where we we see some of this going. The number of weather-related disasters and inflation-adjusted dollars is there at the bottom. We all know this. The number of weather-related disasters is going up. Uh, the way we look at this. Resiliency does not fall neatly into the current regulatory process. IRP processes don't really take into account that. And you're seeing people think about things like IRP 2.0, for instance. How do we look at the IRP process and think about resiliency? The way that we're looking at this, or beginning to look at this, we think something needs to be thought through very carefully, 
The cost to society after weather-related damages can be, in this case, from the Congressional Research Service, 25 to 70 billion dollars a couple years ago. The cost to a utility to recover is much less than that. The example I give here is Katrina was. We think that there is a missing link here, uh, which is the relationship between grid money and the resulting economic and social value of the avoided lost economic output and societal impact is significant. So we heard earlier about someone with, with, you know, with their power down for five days. There's a, there's, a, there's a cost economically to society after these major storms. That somehow needs to be taken into account in the regulatory environment. Um, so to, to quickly wrap up, the, the key piece that we see is a need to address modernization efforts as an insurance policy, that, that, that top point there, an insurance policy for society overall, rather than in the traditional lens of utility cost recovery measures. Uh, because that's sort of a critical, critical point. Um, and resiliency metrics need to consider the value of these various investments in, in some way, the grid hardening piece, and, and how microgrids, for instance, can be used for those hard to reach customers or critical infrastructure. Uh, and then a couple of, couple of final points that, that we look at that we think is important. Um, looking at the ex examples of other states and keeping nuclear uh, in the mix uh, because of, of, of what it can do potentially. Uh, incentivizing the independent developers to include PV plus energy storage. We have a lot of opportunities for that in North Carolina. That's something we need to think about. Uh, and then this concern potentially about the utility commission not being able to authorize those grid modernization riders, that, that's potentially <coughs> something needs to be thought through as well. So at this point, I'll give you a minute or so to finish up on your, on your cards, and Jeanette and our, my team is going to go around and pick up your, your thoughts, and we'll use that. Yes, ma'am. Do you want one thought on each card, or multiple thoughts? If you got multiple thoughts, thoughts, we'll take them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. No, 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 there's, we're moving on to the second, next part of the agenda. So we're going to do a folding exercise, and then you should get to that. Have some fun, guys. Can you put your cell phones out, please? Give me an example of this. Well, this is a business discussion. I have a company to continue to do more of this. Reducing energy. 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 <laughs> this is starting the fun part. The videos are over, so, so we're going to start doing some more interactive activities. And this is the first. So take your cell phones out. Go ahead and don't put any spaces in DEQ Energy Plan. It doesn't matter if it's all caps or not. Take the DEQ Energy Plan to 37607. Go ahead and get started. Let us know when you guys are ready. Who's not ready? Okay, we'll wait. <laughs> Two. Two. Ready to go? Where do I put that 37607 number? Okay, the 37607 should be the number that you're texting oh. to. Okay. So oh. instead of putting in a phone number that you would text to, you put in 37607. It'll, it'll come up and it'll likely put a dash in there for you automatically, but don't worry about that. Then what will happen, you'll, you'll see you'll get a text back that shows that, that you're active. Everybody good? Everybody? Uh, ready to go? No, wait. wait. The instructions should still be up there. Got it? Business model. Okay. Changing the business model. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. You should be talking about it. Yeah, Alright, so you're going to be asked a series of questions, and Kevin's going to read off the first question, and then you do the voting. Okay, and this is the first test one. Basically what you're going to do in each of these exercises, you're simply going to text A, B, 
C, or if there's a D, whatever your answer is, and we'll just kind of watch watch on the screen. Is this thing supposed to ask me the question? So, so the question here is, does North Carolina have the best college basketball teams in any state? Yes. The wildfires, there's a thousand unsafe things about our current energy production system. So it, it's no longer safe. The question is about what happened in the last hundred years. Not about it's not safe now. So yeah. I, I would agree. I guess that's part of it. Because yeah. in the last, as we look backwards, um, hundred years, we have served urban and rural communities um, affordably, reliably, and, and safely. Uh, we've got more safe over the last hundred years. And as the former uh, person spoke, the challenge is what happens in the next hundred years. But if we can agree that we have served the community, I think that's an important point. Remember back when Appalachia had no electricity, we did the dams, we did the whole, uh, whatever the heck it's called, to get power to the poorest people in the nation to raise their quality of life. And so I agree strongly. Uh, I don't know why I didn't do D. I guess uh, I just want to keep the conversation open. Thank you. And what's in the parentheses, serve Lowe's affordably, reliably, and safely? Those are the three tenets under which the Utility Commission makes decisions on how power plants are built and how the rate structure is made. That is, that is what the law says. So we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, we'll next question. Oh, yeah. We're limiting to, if you don't mind. All right. So the next question. Here we go. North Carolina's electricity system, as it is now, supports the procurement of clean energy from a regulatory utility business model perspective. What does that mean? <laughs> Can you explain the question? We have a question back here. We're not sure what the procurement business is all about. Procurement is a lot like net metering, what you said. Procurement means that you're able to purchase electricity that is clean from a third party <coughs> seller, or that you're able to generate your own and be able to be integrated into the system such that it is beneficial to you as a generator of that power. The words business model means that under the current utility business model, which Jonas talked about, you know, that formula he talked about, that R, the rate of return, drives the profit for the utility. The, or the, under the current business model, creating new capital, building things that are assets into our system, drives the business for the utilities. The regulatory perspective means that our, our current utilities commission's uh, orders and decisions they made and the current laws that exist on the books that our General Assembly issues, are those keeping up with the times? Do you see a need for changing that under a modern grid? And that's what this question is about. Thank you. Thank you. Much better explanation than I would have given. I would have glazed your eyes over a heart. OK. Does anyone want to volunteer on their answer and why? Yes, sir. I might be able to speak loud enough. Um, I'm not sure if enough information was put out there to the group about the difference between a regulated and a deregulated, you know, state. Across the country, there are I don't know 12 or 13 different states that have deregulated energy markets. You, as a consumer, mostly commercial, have the ability to purchase energy on the open market. In those cases, uh, you can likely choose. If you buy from a wind farm or a solar farm, it might be more expensive, but you as a consumer have that option. I'm not sure if the DEQ or the governor's office have the ability to have that discussion uh, for bringing North Carolina to a deregulated market environment, but that would certainly allow consumers to choose who they buy their electricity from. It's going to come from Duke, if you're in this area, inevitably, but you'll have the option to choose if it's you know, from a solar farm that's out in the mountains somewhere. And that's my 
question. One more question. You can't do that, though, because they have a monopoly, right? We have a question on company cleaning and regulated versus Any questions? So that, that is the question. We are under a regulated utility structure. And so the question is, does it now support the procurement clean energy under that structure? So my comment is that we, we are not getting actually clean energy. Um, that the ways that we have procured our energy up to now um, has not been clean for people who live next to coal ash plants or who um, live near smokestacks. Um, so the business model has not taken those externalized costs into consideration. Um, so we aren't procuring clean energy at all as it stands. Also, the regulatory agency that is supposed to look into the business model of our public utility has consistently failed to do that in a rigorous way. And just recently, Josh Stein has said, um, hey, wake up, commissioners. It's time to look at what it is that the, our public utility, which is a for-profit company, um, is selling us as the best way to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To your question, um, Texas and ERCOT uh, are, are an example of a deregulated system in the United States. So there are, are deregulated areas within the United States grid system. We're just not one of them. Okay, moving on to the next question. North Carolina's electricity system as it is now can physically accommodate increasing levels of renewable energy from a technology perspective. As you're thinking about this, Jonas, or one of them talked about the, the transmission grid. We talked a little bit about the distribution grid. And the majority of these clean energy technologies are coming in from the bottom up. We have constraints in our transmission sector. And so the question is related to the physical accommodation and the ability of these smaller scale systems, and sometimes collectively, Call utility scale distributed energy resources being physically accommodated to the grid. So we're going to let everybody finish voting before we, we ask questions. Do you, do you have questions about the question? No, I just want yeah. to explain why you answered. Oh, okay. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. 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 So are you talking basically about the transmission of the electron? Without any attribute associated with that electron in terms of the source of that electron? I mean, this is like just the basic infrastructure. I think the basics of the question are, can we integrate more more, more technologies, more more renewable energy onto the grid? It's an infrastructure grid. question, sir. Mm -hmm. It is an infrastructure question. But it's an integration infrastructure question, right? Yes. What you're saying is, can we integrate the new technologies or clean technologies, renewable technologies, into the current electrical system that's providing electricity today for the majority of the people here in North Carolina? That is, is that correct. what the question is saying? Yes. Yeah. Well stated. Okay, so are we ready to take a couple examples? And I can bring in with the first and then, then we'll come up. No, I just wanted to ask one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Which was, um, what would a smart grid provide in the way of being able to integrate more rules that we currently don't have? Could you answer that? The, the basics of the smart grid are two-way two communication, and with two-way communication, now, now you have controls, and now you can have faster controls, and so you can respond to, to different orders, and that helps with the overall integration. I, I don't know if that's a clear way of explaining it, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it to the system here and help out a little more. One of the arguments that often is made by utilities is that um, solar, I'm just taking solar as an example, but technologies like that can be disruptive in terms of the quality of power that is delivered to the grid. We all want to have our phones working and our laptops working in our home, in our offices without disruption. And so what smart grid allows you to do with DERs is that modern communication systems and data analysis and controls 
are enabling DERs to operate like a power plant. And that is a shift in technology that's occurring now as we speak. So now it's not just an on-off where solar power is coming on and off, but the solar power can be dispatched by an operator a lot like a power plant. And the utilities are learning, and states are learning how to best do that. And California is leading it, NYSERDA in New York is leading it, Tampa Electric is leading it, and this is a one way to create a bottom-up um, energy generation and energy control and operation that's changing the dynamics. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead with your question. So well, that, was, that, was, that was exactly my point, is that the grid is the grid, and with smart control, which is what's going in an inverters now, uh, certainly if it were regulated that new inverters had to have those controls, then the utility can have no excuse. They just have to feather their new plants uh, when there's extra solar on the grid. They would learn how to do that. Which sort of to date, in this previous graph showed like ceilings for how much PV can go on the grid and stuff. Those are all based on old engineers' concepts of what you can and can't not do with resources. Absolutely. However, you saw that slide which said how much our electricity rates are. Some of the cheapest in the nation. Building a new grid, a modern grid, there will be cost to it. And it's a lot like the uh, internet system. Over time, it took a little while, but once it got going, it created innovation and, and uh, expanded our economy. Um, that's what we're hearing from the utilities, that building and expanding the system will cost. And it'll, our transmission, according to them, certain transmission lines are fully um, constrained. Uh, creating a distribution grid that allows this will require investment if that is what the public wants. But of course, climate change is extraordinarily expensive and that has to be factored in. Yeah. 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 Can I have in the back? Yeah. In the back? No, I was napping for him. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to, if he gave me the microphone. So I want to say the technology is there, we just have to use it, right? and they have to accommodate that technology into the grid. Also, storage is hugely important. If you have enough storage, you don't even need to be on the grid because you can just store it and use it in place. The storage has to be improved just like the photovoltaics have been improved. And then, of course, the utilities, if they have enough storage, then they can even out demand and not buy additional gas power plants. Mm. Right. Mm. So, and then, you got know, the time, I have to move forward. We're going to go to the next question, yeah. that's okay. Yeah, can, I ask, can I say one other thing for this slide, this question? It's, a, it's an observation. I actually think this slide is um, a little bit of a setup of a slide. I'm going to tell you why. Because until that further definition came, people in the room probably didn't understand what new technology won. What electric? What, what we really mean by or what you mean by electric electricity system, and then the whole concept of renewable energy in that. And so the question, until that further explanation came, doesn't really is, is actually seeking a, a general answer. So the answer you got is 39 percent of the people disagree with it, which basically agrees with the electric company that says that the current infrastructure won't support this. And therefore, mm, right? we yeah. need to invest in, it in the current interest. Wow. And that's not what people here would probably think. You can change your answer right now. Uh, I understand that. I understand right. that. But I'm, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. question. Oh, if we didn't have to pay Zach, though, Lynn Good, $22 million salary a year, we'd have some more money to invest in. Can I just finish, can I finish my point? My point in that is we don't get to ask the questions before we vote. Yes, I get the idea that we can change the vote, but the questions are leading. They're leading a particular answer based on their ambiguity, and I'm not particularly appreciating that right yes. now. The next question is, North Carolina's electricity system, as it is now, suitably addresses equity concerns. And we, we've had questions in, in other sessions about equity, and we're looking at social equity here. Social equity. You have a question about the question? No, I was jumping ahead for the comment portion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, just wait till everybody goes. That sounds good. 
then we'll do the questions. Okay? Just, just wait for everybody. We're taking two questions. That's it. Two questions. Okay, the lady in the back, you were first. I think absolutely our electric system does not address equity. We're looking at the coal ash pollution problem that disproportionately impacts communities of color and low income communities. We're looking at an extractive fossil fuel industry from the fracking fields that feed the gas plants to the mountaintop removal sites that feed the coal plants that disproportionately impact low-income folks and communities of color. And we're looking at communities of color and low-income communities who are least going, who are going to be most impacted by climate change and least um, it situated to be able to uh, be impacted by, or to be able to benefit. Um, we're going to see, in fact, rich people benefit from climate adaptation and poor people suffer the most. Um, and of course, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, um, like we talked about earlier, the compressor stations and the infrastructure that's being built out for that disproportionately impacts communities of color and low-income communities. And I think equity, if we really want to address equity, it is far past time to address climate change by investing in clean energy. I vote to disagree because I am 18 and I will be going to college and that will be a great financial burden on me and going into the workforce and then trying to secure something like a home. I know that I'm going to be very economically challenged um, due to the financial structure of our times and I know that it's going to come up that am I going to pay the electric bill at some point in my life and I know that especially um, in communities of color and other disadvantaged communities, again, this is, a, this is a struggle and people have to decide what they're going to pay. Are they going to pay their car bill? Are they going to pay for this? Or are they going to pay for that? And it's extremely important. And then also a second note, side note, I'd like to ask everyone to be patient with the state employees here because the state legislature is the one that really needs to be held accountable here. Um, so these people are working very hard to help gather what we have to share as a community, but also let's be patient with them because the state legislature is the one that's really screwing things up. <laughs> as we don't get to everyone's you know, question and answer and comment, you can always write it down on the card and, and we will have it collected. That's what we're here to do today. We're here to collect your comments so that we can roll this into the overall plan so we get to share everyone's perspective as best we can. And as, as Sushma said, we are trying our best to, you know, to get comments from all over the state. And also on this form here that has five questions, there are links for you to comment. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. And it is, North Carolina's electricity system as it is now is reliable and resilient during severe weather events. The ones we're having now, or the ones we are going to have? Remember, only two questions. <laughs> Okay, voting. Who wants to give an answer? Why the answer? Read behind you. I'll, I'll just be mine. Uh, so I answered somewhat agree, just because uh, the linesmen and rolling trucks, they do a great job of responding to outages, but the whole point of resiliency is it should be not going out in the first place or self healing. So, self -healing. so props to the guys who go out there in the rain and the snow, but that's not the same thing as results. Okay, I'm going to recognize the lady up in the front now. She's been raising her hand. Yeah, just about every question. The problem is, um, if you live in a wealthy area, 
if you live in a wealthy area where there's lots of resources and things happen quickly and you're not near the coal ash plants or you're not near sea, sea level rise, I mean, yeah, I think that Duke does a pretty good job, but quite frankly, I think that we're speaking to the inequality, the class inequality, and I think people who are living in Robeson County, for example, or any of the counties out in the eastern part of our state, have seen unbelievable, tragic destruction of their property. And yes. of course, what? Yes, people died. Yeah, people died. And then if you look at Puerto Rico, I mean, you can just see the differences. People just don't get recovered, and it can go on for years. And it, it just isn't. It isn't equal at all. So I, I couldn't really agree. I mean, it's like wealthy, yes, poor, no. All right, so that's our two questions. I'm going to move on. And I think this is the last question we have on the polling exercise here. So the fun is almost over. <laughs> so North Carolina's electricity system, as it is now, gives customers options for controlling their energy use and the source of their energy. serve all you want, but if this fee keeps ratcheting up, uh, you know, utilities love to talk about low rates, but you, nobody pays a rate, you pay a bill. So if this fixed fee keeps going up, and we saw from the slides we have very high consumption, for 12, 12 out of 50, that's pretty high for consumption, therefore people are actually losing the ability to control their energy use, even if they're being thrifty. You know, you're paying 20 bucks before you even flip on a light switch. So that actually gets back to the equity question in the earlier one. And I just looked on the report to see 65 of our 100 counties are considered um, unaffordable or very unaffordable for energy burden. This means people are paying 6% or more. I mean, these are staggering numbers. Uh, they should be staggering numbers for all of us. Um, so, no, I, we should. Oh, we should give people the ability to choose and to control, but we're not even close to that. Good job, Anybody? One more? One more. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, in, across the board, uh, first, I appreciate what the young man said about the legislature and also applaud you folks working on these projects here. But we look at just in terms of this presentation and in general, we've heard about the pipeline, we've heard various things about nuclear power, social justice, there's a whole list. My question here is at what point does the idea of a, a full cycle accounting come into play that almost every part of this presentation, and it's a good job, I'm, I'm asking a question, I'm not trying to be critical, silos all these different issues. Mm -hmm. And if we don't count the environmental impact, if we don't count the social impact, the, you know, and all these things, we're kind of never going to get anywhere. It's not just the economics of the return on a rate of investment for the utility, it's the overall burden and cost. And so the question in general is, I'll write it down here, is how do we get the actual full accounting costs, and I know it's a very complex issue, I've been working on it for decades, 
But it's a constant problem I see, is that, well, this is how we calculate the cost, and don't talk about that part, don't talk about that. What about 400 billion to decommission nuclear power plants? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just throwing something out there. That matters. Yeah. So that's my question, thank you. It's a very good question, and uh, it's a holistic look at planning horizon, right? Um, it requires, of course, legislative action. And many of these, what we talked about, requires legislative actions. We are an agency that assists in a policy, asking these questions, thinking bigger, uh, going around trying to figure out what the vision is. We're not in a position to, at least we don't have the authority, of course, but there are other organizations in the state government that has been assigned that authority. So remember the first or second question that says, least cost, affordable, reliable? Those are the three tenets of our power system now. If you want to add environmental components and other components that are integrated into that evaluation, then that's where it starts. We need that, that discussion to occur at that level. It's specifically listed in North Carolina statutes that the environment is part of this. Yes. The utility. Harming the public is a main tenet of Duke and so, the commissioners. So that, you know, we'll take these messages, obviously. We have, as, as a, let me just say, as an environmental agency, we regulate our uh, sources of emissions under uh, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. We've had similar discussions with the commission about what role environmental benefits play in their decision making, and it's a, it's, um, it's a, it's a continuing dialogue and in their interpretation of the statute. Okay. Thank you all for participating. Uh, my colleague Lori Collins will come up next. Okay. Um, this is another interactive piece. So I think you all have in your stacks a page that looks like this. It's a list of um, values. So, um, so we're going to spend some time thinking about this. So just make sure everybody has. In some other sessions, we passed them out, but today we, we passed them out as you came in. So this um, exercise is to help us think strategically about the future and base our strategies around a framework that incorporates your top values. There's a lot of things on here. You're going to look at this list and think, well, all of these are important. But what we'd love for you to do is take a few minutes. We'll just, you know, I'll sit here for a moment. Take a few minutes to go through these and mark what are your top three. So then what we'll do is we'll, we'll pick this up as a survey. And I know there's, there's several different categories, but we, we just want your top three overall. And then we'll ask folks to speak about which ones you selected and why. So does, is anybody missing this page? We can, we've got more copies if needed. So three out of the whole list? Yeah, three, three out of the whole list. Wait, three in each category? No, no, three, no, no, three out of the total. entire total. list. Yeah, for the whole only, page. Only three. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you want us to do it on the uh, paper or online? No, do it on paper. Just, oh, okay. just mark it. Just mark on here. I know it's a lot, and they all—they're all colleagues look very important. Let's answer that. But if you can just pick, you can explain. Uh, well, complicated. There's a couple that we know. Let's see, my no parts. Um, there's a couple that we've had questions about. So I could start with those in case you might have questions. Please do. Um, does everybody understand universal service? No. Okay, so that's one we've had questions about. So universal service is defined, I mean, you can Google this. This is like a, a standard term, not something we made up. A policy that guarantees universal access to a basic package of electrical services at an affordable rate. It's called universal service because electric service is considered a necessity for all households in North America. What's energy so, independence? What, what is that? Energy independence. Well, I'll give you, a, I'll take a crack at a definition and then we'll, we'll see if solutions in the room. Energy independence oh, means sorry. that we're a, that, let's say if North Carolina was totally energy independent, that we would be able to source all of our energy needs within the boundaries of North Carolina. Yeah, yeah. Well, without without having, need the state. Yeah, without having yeah. to import. Yeah. Solar and wind. 
Right. I mean, but you know, I guess the question is, can we can we get there with our own specific natural resources just in North Carolina, yes. or is that a goal? Yes. I mean, th this is about values, so so don't lose sight of the idea that this is what we value. So the the top values are the things that we will have as the top priorities um, to frame our strategic decisions. I'm curious about future focused. I, I get that the uh, longer planning horizons. What is this little piece about avoided stranded assets? Okay, so stranded assets uh, means something, say a, um, a coal mine. And I'm just gonna use that as a stranded asset. We put a ton of money into it. It's on somebody's balance sheet, say it's Dukes or some other company as an asset. And when it's stranded, means that it's no longer valuable. So what's the avoided use. part of this? Yeah. So avoided. So you try not to have stranded assets. Okay, I'll give you another example. Oh, avoiding, it should be the Jared then. It should be yeah. avoiding the stranded assets. Right. That yeah. doesn't make sense the other way. Thank okay. you. Okay, so, so the value would be to try not to have a lot of stranded assets. That's the value, okay. is because that hurts investors. For example, it's a waste of capital. Oh, I get it. If you build something, then you can't use it. Yeah. So, but if you build that question, and the opposite of that would be that you're not trying to avoid, you're, you're trying to keep those assets from being stranded, is that correct? It can be, I guess it can be read right. two ways. Right, yeah, because, but no, right. it can be read two ways. So you can avoid it by not building something that you know is gonna be obsolete, <laughs> mm -hmm. or you could avoid it by continuing to use the assets you have. I think the idea here is we don't wanna build things that are gonna become obsolete. That's what okay. avoided stranded assets. Okay. Yeah, May I just point out that I think you have energy independence in the wrong place? Because energy independence is really an economic... It, you know what, it doesn't matter because you can pick three from any category. So it doesn't matter how it's categorized. I'm just worried that it's being interpreted yeah. different broadly. Okay. Uh, for conservation of that environmental conservation or energy conservation, what conservation? Well, it's a little bit open to interpretation as a value. So conserving natural resources. These are, yeah, conserving, conserving your resources. Your interest, your perspective. Rule fast that all these concepts in your final plan, they're really going to matter how you all interpret it. You know, what you plan on doing with these concepts. But innovation, an ethical, responsible approach to innovation where you can allow for at least a discussion on hydrogen systems. Is this a versus, question? Yeah, it is. Versus what we're getting with Duke Energy Grid Modernization, it allows everybody to understand um, options on stranded costs and, and energy independence versus exporting gigatons of natural gas. And anyways, so okay, I'll come back if you want to comment on what you voted on. Does anybody else have a question <laughs> on, we'll do our best, as best we can. I mean, these are broad concepts, so you know, there's not one definition, actually. These are broad concepts. We're trying to give you the, the, the best, we're giving you things that are sort of formal definitions. I'll, I'll take you well, first, sir. What if our uh, goal is to break up Duke's monopoly? That is a big value in my mind, but it's not my <laughs> You can write it in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would help me to understand um, how you're going to utilize these. Yes. So because they are so broad, right, there will be a lot of interpretation in order. So, I mean, so to what, be totally what are we honest, honest, trying to get from us? From, in we're trying aspects. to understand what our constituency, you know, the, the citizen of North Carolina, the constituency most values. I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of inputs. We can't tell you exactly how we're going to use this at this moment because we've got a lot of inputs. We'll probably have several iterations as we try to write the plan. This is a guidance to help us understand where our constituencies are coming from. You know, what is going to bubble to the top? Where, where the, is there is there a um, you know sort of a, a clustering of values across the state as we get input? And also picking three and eliminating all the rest is another, just like this lady talked about earlier, a bad choice, a bad set of choices. Any other? Okay, so are people ready to tell us um, what you voted for and why? Oh, before we wait, wait, hold on. You've spoken before, so let me, let me hold on and see if there's somebody else. We only going to have two people. Oh. Yeah, so. Oh. 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 
What does customer data access ownership mean? Customer data, I can answer that quickly. So customers want to know, you know, want more information on, so as a utility customer, you want more information on how much energy you use, what time of day you used it, what was the source of energy that came into your, you know, came into your home. And some of that information is not easily available. What about ownership? It means you have access to the information. That, that you, yeah, that you own that information for the for your home. Okay. So, um, who wants to say what they chose and why? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to take you. I just wanted to. Okay. No, I wanted. To okay. All right. The, actually, the fellow behind you hasn't spoken yet, so we'll probably know. Well, since I'm not sure if you're happy to have an open session at all, I selected innovation because I feel like one of the things that's really missing here is I feel like that even in what your presentations are, or what you can hear from some of you individually, you kind of get it. But I think as a as an institution, you don't. The solar is changing the world right now. I mean, it really is. It's like the sunshot. You had the right graphs up here. Sunshot 2030 goals are going to lower the price of solar from 2017 mm -hmm. to sometime in the near future, probably by 50% again. It's going to radically change the system. Yet the utilities in their IRP, which you had graphs going showing what they thought the long-term maximum amount of renewable energy did was something like 30%. Yeah. These are these are just inconsistent concepts. Yeah. Somebody's got just a fundamental thing wrong. <laughs> yeah. And so I just want to throw on the table innovation because we happen to have an SDIR grant mm -hmm. for a major innovation in renewable energy and solar that will extremely accelerate mm -hmm. and lower the cost more than fifty percent. So these are the things that I think should really be paid attention to. Great. We're, we're in an innovation center. So. Mm -hmm. um, let me is this gentleman behind. Me? Go ahead. My name is Roy Harrison. I've been living in the state of North Carolina probably mm -hmm. I don't know. Six to nine years, 55 of those years, from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the East Coast all the way to the mountains. And when I come to sessions like this, there's three things I, I start to listen for. I grew up in a segregated society. I went through integration, and now I'm in gentrification. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think what, is, what comes after gentrification. Mm -hmm. There it is. Which one? All of them. All of them. And so I, I asked myself those questions when I come and said, quite frankly, I didn't know what I was coming to today, but I decided, well, it's downtown. It's here. I'm going to see it. I'm going to be a part of it. And so I learned a lot of things from segregation, integration, gentrification. asking, well, how can I get, be involved when, I, when you're limiting the workshop? So this was a way to, um, to get the feedback. What Lori said is it's a way to understand when there's a common clustering or there's a common theme around the state in terms of what is of most important value to the citizens of North Carolina. Business communities have a different value system. You know, citizens have a different, local governments have a different. And what we're seeing so far is very similar uh, values across the state. Now, I don't know if we're going to see something different in the eastern part of North Carolina, mm -hmm. but uh, climate has always been at the top. Equity has been coming up at the top. Um, working with the utilities, creating some model for the future to, um, to, to, to enable them to be part of this process has been coming up at the top, too. So just to give you an idea, it, 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 it hones in our radar screen towards uh, not all of them, so we, we, we have a limited amount of time. Most states takes two years to three years to generate an energy plan like this. We as a state have never done this to my knowledge, uh, going out and trying to create a, a vision for our future. Um, so 
that, I'm sure, I hope that helps. So we're going to go over to the last part of the exercise, and that is dealing with uh, a series of questions. Um, you all have um, note cards. Anybody need more note cards? Okay. Jeanette and the team are going to pass that around. The last part of the exercise, and then I'll open it up for, if we have time, um, just open comments and thoughts. Um, what we're asking um, all of our stakeholders is a series of five questions. And these five questions are in one of the sheets that's been given out to you. You don't have to answer them today. Go home, think about it, talk to people how, you know, like you, and send it to us via email, or there's an online form too. But we've extracted two questions out of those five questions, and we thought it would be a good way to sort of create a dialogue. And one of the questions is, what features of the existing system that we've been talking about all day are challenges to deployment of clean energy? So think about that, and put that down on your cards, and I'll do a little popcorn exercise to ask if anyone wants to share their thoughts.
So people are writing, so I'm going to give it a minute or two. Anybody need more time? I'm happy to do that. Okay. So, who'd like to share with us your thought on that, this this question? I would. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the the big challenge I see is, as I said before, is the lack of storage. But we can't have storage based on lead batteries or lithium. Lithium batteries are great because they're lightweight. They work great in your computer. But they're a tiny little battery that, that is extremely expensive. There's cheap electrolytes that don't use lead, don't use heavy metals. The technology is there, but it's not well known. These utility people need to look at that and innovate. So it's real cheap. It takes a lot. You have to have a, a lot of, uh, it's a big electrolyte system, so it uses a lot of volume. It's like you need a, a hot tub for your energy storage. That needs to be right next to your photovoltaic system. Then you don't need to be on the grid. But if you are on the grid, it'll reduce the peak because the utility companies can do it too. They need to, they need to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh Directly, look at what, it, you know, what are the features of the existing system. Uh, I think if we can almost safely say there's no technological barriers to this at all at this stage of the game. Some develop them and just qualify it from there. But the barriers to really deploying clean energy, number one, come back into there's no full cycle accounting for what are the actual costs and benefits of clean energy versus traditional, the way the system is right now. It's very, very broken up. It's just not right to do the math and leave things in and out. Uh, secondly, the mentality, attitude, whatever, that the, the basically short-term profits matter. And it's a cycle issue, whatever. You know, yes, they matter to an extent. We're not rolling it out. But when that is how all this is worked out, how are they going to make a return on the investment in that whole structure? That's a bear. That's a barrier to moving forward, whether you like it or not. I mean, you know, I'm not taking a position on it. And then finally, um, the, the current monopoly and regulations are a huge barrier to moving forward. I've been off grid for 25 years with solar. It works great. I've never had a power failure. You know, if I can do it, you know, with no money, you know, basically, bro, anybody can do it. I mean, I pieced it together, and there's a few exceptions here, but it's the very, the, the monopoly is one, and the other is the regulations that were put in place, which were really, relatively speaking, great regulations in the 1940s and 50s. But it's gone, it, it's not right now. And these are the real barriers. It's not technological, it's not arguing about you know, battery storage versus hydrogen versus solar and so forth. We, those are all important points, but they're not the barriers. Note on that in support of what this gentleman here spoke about innovation 
because in that, the, on that goal statement, innovation was only listed under the economic category. And I found that a little um, disturbing in a way, because I don't think it's just about economics. It's about our community. It's about our social spheres. And, and that whole, uh, the whole Venn diagram um, that shows where um, economics are on the outside and social is in the inside of that diagram is, I think, is an inaccurate view that is driven by monopolies and especially by energy companies today and here in North Carolina especially that were being driven by that economic view and it's not our economic view because right. it's not equity, it's right. their economic view. It's investors. So, it is. It's the investor's economic view and as, as long as the you know, CEO of Duke Energy makes, what, $10 billion or whatever, you're some astronomical figure, and we sit here and debate, we didn't today, thank you, but that we debate that $125 average electric bill for a person that's living at poverty level of uh, North Carolina's minimum wage is, is an, um, it might be an issue at 5%. I would say that we have to, we have to rethink, we have to restructure, and I appreciate this effort that's gone in here, but my general feeling for this, and not towards you personally or any of the efforts that you people have put in, but that the general direction is that we're still stuck in old thought process. Yeah. 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 We're not asking the right questions, we're just asking questions that fall under the same, the same um, method of thinking we've been thinking for 50 years to 100 years. That's what has to change. That's the discussion that I came down today. The listening that I thought that we would be able to express would be like, let's ask the right questions. Let's not ask the same questions that we've been asking. Let's flip this. Let's talk about, because we're talking to the, the DQ of North Carolina. We're not talking to Duke Energy's representative, hopefully. And when, when, I, when I sit here and wait through presentations that I already took the time to look at at home, and I appreciate all of your time, but everybody in this room has also taken out time to review this online, time to be here today as well. And those that listening has to come broadly. When we sit and listen to presentations that are generally given by, with Duke Energy's involvement in those presentations, that to me says, where's the agnostic behavior then? We need agnostic thought mm -hmm. so that we can get to new levels of solutions because we're not asking new questions. We're asking the same questions within the same boundaries. And those barriers, I'm getting to the point of what you asked right here, is those barriers are exactly what the gentleman spoke about back there and what this gentleman spoke about innovation. We have to put social first, our community, our safety, our health, those things have to come first, where 50 years from now, well, we won't be here. But if we could be here in 30 years from now, the people will be wondering, what the heck did they do? I thought we really had new plans here in North Carolina. Yeah. And I don't think we're coming up with new plans. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. Bravo, um, these, these presentations, these questions were not developed in concert with any private firm. It said Duke Energy on the slide, I'm sorry. No, not Duke University, but it also said Duke Energy is Duke's initiative. It was Duke University. Okay, and then that, that's that. a completely different entity oh, yeah. than Duke okay. Power. Well, I get that uh, they so are supported by that. The other thing I'd like to make a point is we could have just sat here and said, give us your comments and we'll take it home. But instead, we wanted to have a conversation. And this was our best way to ask questions. You have every ability to provide comments and thoughts outside of these questions. It's not limited. As I said in, on the website, you can go in and put one sentence or 50 sentences. It'll get considered. This, so, is, a, this is a great question. You asked it, and that's very good. Well, I guess I, I'm glad you liked it, but we, <laughs> <laughs> the goal was not to you know, pigeonhole people into thinking. No, this was our best uh, effort is starting a conversation. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question, and which is the last question, and that is the sort of the reverse of that, that question we just had. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Please pass on your cards.
So the next question is, what features of the existing system should be maintained going forward to support the deployment of clean energy? So take your time answering and I'll wait. I'll, I'll take, the, unless you need question, uh, you have questions clarifying the question. I'll raise your hand. I do have a question. Does this include democracy? as we understand it in our constitution originally. <laughs> so, you could write that down. Um, you could, um, if you want, if that's how you want to interpret it. Does North Carolina currently offer any kind of rebates or encouragement for solar energy? Uh, yes, no. not, not as a state, as a tax incentive, that was taken away. No. However, under House Bill 589, there are some but it's still being worked out um, as to how you can get in. But the residential sector, not as much. There are still federal um, incentives, but they may go away. So existing system means grid system? Is that yes, we're talking system? about the power grid. We talked yeah, about, we talk about policy system and all that. Just to... mm -hmm. That includes the regulatory model, includes the business incentives, includes the physical infrastructure. And we can say the sustainability agenda, as you said, interpret it as you wish, add the sustainability targets that um, Ned and others have Well, the question is what features of the existing system should be maintained, should be kept as is. I'm to the first, this prior question, I should say. Okay. A few more minutes. Do you have any figures on how much uh, Duke is doing? I've been to a few meetings with them. They say they're doing a lot with solar. Do you, do you have a feel for that? Like mm -hmm. a percentage, probably in the last five years, I'd say. That's a very good question, and I will answer that. I'm glad somebody asked that question. Mm -hmm. Where are we and where are we going? If you look at the Integrated Resource Plan, which just got released last September, it shows that and Kate mentioned that solar is at about 3,000 um, megawatt capacity right now. Yep. Under House Bill 589, I think we're looking at about six to 7,000 megawatt, which equates to um, doubling under the REPS program. So REPS uh, targets 12.5% by 2021, and it's estimated as if House Bill 589 from 2017 is implemented fully then that 12.5% may equate to about 19 to 20%, roughly doubling it. If you look at the IRP, um, Duke's projection for additional solar entering the power grid is flatlining after 2024, 2025. And the amount of solar being added to the grid in the late 20s is, I think my staff has done some calculations on those projections, is minuscule. The amount of storage is not um, measurable. It's small. And that is the IRP. And one of the questions that we're asking is, as we grow as a state, we have people moving here, we have businesses growing, the demand is growing. Although we're doing a lot of energy efficiency, the demand is still increasing. How do we supply that energy in the future? With the questions we should be asking is, what generation sources are going to supply that energy? But at the same time, we have invested in these assets. Do, do those assets become stranded? And if they become stranded because we want clean energy, then who's going to bear the cost of that? So there are lots of difficult questions. The solutions are not straightforward. Of course, we can certainly come up with a collective vision of what is, which direction we want to go and what price we want to pay. But that's ultimately how it's going to uh, be resolved uh, in the 2020s. There's two things, that other things that, that didn't come out, and I like to say that, is um, 2020s and early 2030s are going to be transform transformational years in the power grid and the, in the transportation sector. And what that means is we talked a lot about technology innovation, commercialization, the convergence of variety of, of uh, lower, cheaper opportunities and, and drivers that are affecting 
power generation and transportation. And as these forces take place, um, how do we prepare ourselves and position ourselves and asking these questions, getting ready for them, um, will enable us to take that opportunity. Uh, there are some states out there, they're aggressively bringing businesses, bringing ideas, changing their regulatory models, changing their utility models to prepare for that future. Uh, we're at an inflection point in both of those sectors to the very same point that smartphones came out in 2007. Uh, and so I personally feel like these are good questions to ask at this point because that transformation is about to occur in the next five to 10 years. Okay. Great, right, so uh, we'll take two thoughts on the responses. Yes, sir. How many do you have? Uh, so my answers were pretty simple. It's based on uh, encouraging the utilities to and what is your name, sir? Ashley, Ashley Edwards. Thank you. Uh, encouraging utilities to favor grid maintenance and modernization rather than the purchasing and delivery of fossil fuels as you know part of their business model. Um, still understanding maybe they don't make a lot of money off of it, but um, just kind of taking that off the plate. So anything to do with transmission. Uh, demand response, uh, keeping the RE, uh, the reps, uh, keeping the federal tax credit, uh, keeping our pump storage that we already have in place, and aggressive fines for pollution so they continue to be discouraged to operate that way. Thank you for that feedback. Sure. One more? Any other thoughts on what should be maintained? I think we need to revive the Declaration of Independence, as written in our Constitution. And if we could do that, I think we have a majority of people in this country who want a paradigm shift, and they want a paradigm shift rapidly. And if we don't do it in the next 10 years, our scientists are telling us we have lost this fight. And so we have to have democracy and money out of politics and people in power who represent those of us who want this. Um, so as a wrap up item, this is an open um, process. And my last question is, is there anything else you'd like to share with us um, regarding the current existing policy, regulatory, and utility uh, structure? And just as an open process. So I'll take three comments, please. Mm -hmm. Um, you, this lady right here. Uh, yeah. Sophia, you see that? Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, uh, a lot of the responses here have been, it seems like people are unsatisfied with the status quo. So, in your mind, what is the most constructive way for community members to provide their feedback and actually make effective decisions? It's a very good question. And I think as you give the feedback, um, it is helpful to think about pragmatic and practical solutions. Think about ways in which it can be phased in. If you want a dramatic change overnight, the amount of effort, the amount of all the things that need to line up in order to make that effect will take time. There are some low-hanging fruits, some easy to check off things that can be done today that we're looking for some immediate feedback on. As you think about more of a bigger shift, then we're asking for where specifically in the structure, whether it's the laws, or whether it's the, it's the way the Utilities Commission does things, how the Energy Policy Council consider things, how the DEQ and the Governor's Office prioritizes things, then recommend those. And I think all we can do through this plan is explain what the public want. And to be able to prioritize those and say, we need regulatory reform here. We need administrative leadership here. We need um, legislative oversight, legislative review in these areas because the public is asking for it. That's my suggestion. First of all, thank you so much for holding this session. I really appreciate it. I could this online. We could submit our requests or our observations online. 
I feel there is so much to be gained by a simple face-to-face, -face, being in the same room, and having you give your responses to our immediate questions. So this is invaluable, and thank you very, very, very much for doing it. Um, I looked again at the EO80 and about the Clean Energy Plan, and again and again, it is mentioned of, about the council and um, other entities uh, wanting input and working with municipalities and communities. I feel there is enormous expertise throughout the state. Um, I know here in Asheville we had an Office of Sustainability 10 years ago, and great work was done by Maggie Ullman, who was the head of it then. Um, she is clearly just a repository of knowledge and information. How can the people who, who know and have been doing this for a long time throughout the state share that, that knowledge, that information, those experiences, best practices, in ways that can help each, each other? How can communities talk to each other? How can communities talk to you? How can you, with your resources, come to communities to speak on the level of policy and uh, practices? Because that seems like that's written throughout the executive order that that will happen, but it's unclear to me how that will happen. Thank you. So that is a very good question. The executive order addresses climate impact analysis. It, it creates a structure for a conversation within the cabinet agencies. There is the climate mitigation aspects through trans clean transportation and clean energy, building efficiency. And then there is the uh, the look at how do we what is it how do we do risk assessment what is value to us and and what is at risk in terms of those things that we value that means how do we create resiliency towards things that are most important to the public and then how do we create an action plan to protect those risk uh, assets the second part is a um, is a conversation and is a plan development that we're seeking universities expertise to help the departments in um, formulating a plan. We're reaching out to the local governments and local communities in that, our counterparts in other areas. This is a, um, a, a conversation that's gonna go on for not just one month or two months, but it's an ongoing dialogue. The next uh, April 26th meeting of the Climate Council, which uh, Secretary Regan runs, which I help him as an executive designee, we're focusing on climate resiliency and climate adaptation. And we're working with the university sector to downscale the national climate assessment to North Carolina so that we have a better understanding of what are the regional impacts in terms of temperature, sea level rise, flooding, um, landslides, all of those things, but more at a, at, a, at a local level. And then based on that, we do the risk assessment and resiliency. The models that are being done at the, at the local level, there are some great examples in Asheville and in, in the Triangle. Uh, around Wilmington, but those are the benefits of a metropolitan area. There are plenty of local communities that don't have that kind of uh, resources. So we're trying to do workshops and reach out and do educational um, opportunities for them through our partners with others, other universities and, and NGOs and others, and federal agencies too. So one more, I guess. Um, I know this isn't in the purview of the Department of Environmental Quality, but it is of the governor. And as we look to the power of the North Carolina Utilities Commission and the appointment process, which is about to unfold, it seems quite important that we get new leadership. Ed Finley has been there for a long time. It's an eight-year appointment. And that, that leadership needs to be some that have bought into a rapid transition to renewable energy. Here, here. I just wanted to voice that publicly. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, one more. He's been raising his hand for a while. Sorry about that. No, I just want to, reflecting on both, uh, really everyone who just spoke, that I really think it's important that you guys step back and think about what it is you're basing your assumptions on. Because I've heard you say multiple, I'm not pointing a finger at all. I've heard you say multiple times things that our utility told you that it's going to cost money to raise the infrastructure that you were going to. That is not true. You know, I'm an engineer, so I, I can prove that. And my point is, Make sure, and we've done this locally with Duke. We have a process here locally with Duke, and they come online, they've learned a lot. 
they found out things they didn't know. <laughs> and they did, like putting in batteries. When we started two years ago at the ITF, they had no idea that batteries were even there. Told the man the second week, look, you're going to learn something. By golly, of course, batteries are already in. You know? So it's like, this is a very rapidly moving field. These energies, and these engineers inside do, do not know how this is going to evolve. And I think it's really important that you take that on board and realize that you have to have these fresh voices, have to be in the commission, they have to be in talking to you guys, so that you're not buying the party line and thinking, oh, that's really the truth. That's not the truth. So I want to clarify that I, I didn't mean to say that I'm accepting everything I hear. No, so, um, you know, uh, just want to... No, 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 that's not a finger pointed. Not a finger pointed. Okay, so um, one suggestion I have, this is, uh, we started this about a month ago, and like I said, we're going on through June, July. Keep an eye on our website. We're posting a lot of these workshop-related materials in the future, like the next two to three workshops, we're going to bring in some experts from across the country to talk about what's happening, um, what's, what's the trends out there. Um, and related to that, there'll be opportunities to provide comments. So, uh, you know, just uh, go to that, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, to ship it out. Will this you? end with a report or some legislation recommendation? So the like I said in my beginning of my slides, the objective here is to create a clean energy plan that contains a variety of rec recommendations, regulatory policy, programmatic, administrative. It will even, you know, even include recommendations for, for the private sector and the businesses. Um, we look forward to it. So, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Oh. I want everybody to go home happy, thinking as much as we're frustrated with Trump and what he's trying to do, that has that made the states and local do a lot more. You got it. Thank you. How are you?